debate. There will also be the possibility for you to submit questions uh, via whatever platform you're, what you're using to uh, join the webinar. For example, in Zoom, you can use the chat button um, at the bottom of the screen. And uh, there are other options in other, other platforms. Before going to the panel, I would like to introduce myself briefly and then say a brief word about the sponsors of the petition and what led us to, to launch it. My name is Richard Kinley and I'm the president of FOGS, the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability. And I was formerly a senior official running international climate negotiations for the United Nations. FOGS is a small think tank. It's based in Brussels, but it has a global reach and a global perspective. We want to promote a stronger, more effective, and human-centered UN system, and a more sustainable and equitable global economy. FOGS supports a fair and more inclusive form of globalization through improved global governance, sustainability and citizenship. I would invite you to visit our website and, and that of Katakois, our online magazine, uh, and to keep in touch with us uh, in the future. It was in this, with this background uh, about our interests that Foggs and Katakois launched the Engage for Better petition. We wanted to get people talking about uh, these ideas and even more importantly, pressing their leaders to make sure that the world recovers better from the COVID-19 crisis. This will mean coming to grips with the interconnected problems that have exacerbated the COVID-19 crisis, such as weaknesses in the health systems, income and social inequality, and liberal economic policies. It also means coming to grips with underlying problems and issues like the global climate crisis, creeping authoritarianism and digital erosion of human rights, and weakened global institutions. It's clear that the world needs strong and effective governments, whether nationally, regionally, or locally, but we also need international cooperation and effective multilateral institutions, as well as informed and engaged citizens. These are not either or choices. We need all of them. And at both national and international levels, the institutions need to be more democratic and more focused on human requirements. The good news is that many of the solutions to respond to the pandemic and its disastrous economic fallout can have hugely beneficial impacts and make our world more equitable, more sustainable, and more oriented to people than to corporations. But this will require strong political action and political choices by governments, hence our desire to use this petition as one means to press for these. And this is what we wanted to talk about with you today. You'll find on your screen now or later links to the FOGS website and to that of Katoikos, our online magazine. Please visit them, register for updates, sign the petition if you haven't, and share it uh, with your friends and networks. With that, uh, as a brief uh, forward to our panel discussion. I'd now like to call on our first panelist, Yuriko ya uh, Yasukawa. Yuriko is a member of the FOGS Advisory Board, a commentator on public policy questions, and was uh, a, se a, former, a senior official uh, of the United Nations. Yuriko, could you kick off the panel discussion by painting for us the broad picture of why you think we need to engage for better. Sorry, forgot to unmute. Thank you. Good morning, everyone from Costa Rica. 
Um, so I will talk briefly about how the pandemic is affecting all spheres of our lives uh, and at the same time also offering us an opportunity to push for change for the better and how I think this petition uh, responds to both. Um, it is pretty obvious that on, it is the pandemic is a horrific public health catastrophe, so I won't go into that aspect. Um, it is an economic and social disaster, as Richard mentioned. Um, there are millions of people around the world losing their jobs, their livelihoods, and this is um, hitting uh, those who are engaged in small and medium em enterprises, self-employed people, daily wage earners, people in the informal sector, uh, more uh, than others. Um, poverty is increasing and deepening. By some calculations, maybe half a billion people, additional people can fall into poverty because of the pandemic. There's even a fear of widespread famine. Uh, we're also seeing that the pandemic is intensifying political polarization and conflict. Um, we see that it's exacerbating tendencies toward authoritarianism, extreme nationalism that uh, is also blocking really badly needed international cooperation. Um, it's also serving as a pretext for prejudice, discrimination, xenophobia against those of us who are different. Uh, and I think many of us are seeing around us um, conflict over whether and how much to continue social distancing versus reopening the economy and more broadly about how much governments can and should intervene in the lives of citizens. And this is kind of turning into an all or nothing battle rather than a rational debate. Um, so the pandemic is affecting our health, our livelihoods the way we're governed, how we live together as societies. And I think it's also exposed and highlighted the good and bad, the strengths and weaknesses in all of these spheres. And especially it's, it's laid bare the really gross inequalities and injustices in the systems and institutions that we built in these different spheres. Uh, the injustice of people not being able to exercise their right to health, with half of the world's population without access to basic health services, um, the injustice of certain groups of people not being able to protect themselves from the disease because they cannot afford to stay home or are not allowed to stay home from work, uh, or their living situation is such that it's impossible to do social distancing or even have access to clean water to wash their hands. Uh, those living in slums, those who are homeless, those who are living in refugee camps, um, and the injustice of the economic impact of the pandemic hitting those who are already vulnerable the hardest, and hence uh, aggravating, widening that inequality. Um, but at the same time, as I said, the crisis also offers an opportunity for change. Um, and I think precisely because it's made those vulnerabilities and injustices so visible uh, and shown us how unacceptable they are, um, and even more unacceptable because the virus, I think, is also showing us that they are bad for all of us, not just for the people who are at the butt of those um, injustices. Um, because if there are people who are exposed to the virus or countries where um, the pandemic can't be contained because of these inequalities. It makes us all vulnerable. Um, and we're also seeing how much we depend on people who have to expose themselves to the risk of infection every day, whether they're, they're, medical, uh, whether they're medical workers or people who work in grocery stores, garbage collection, or other daily necessities of our own lives. Um, and we are seeing, I think, very heartening manifestations of solidarity and empathy uh, of communities coming together to help the elderly or to support essential workers. We see expressions of recognition and gratitude toward health workers, postal workers, supermarket employees, bus drivers, and others engaged in work that, frankly, we didn't bother to even think about until now. Um, and the pandemic, by virtue of being a global pandemic, 
has, I think, also helped us to see and literally see in images, both in traditional and social media, beyond our borders to recognize the shared humanity uh, of all of us around the world. We see people struggling with the same challenges, taking joy in the same things all around the world. Uh, and I think this has a special significance under the circumstances uh, because we've seen how much the human bonds that bind us to others matter and really matter above all else. Um, and I think at the level of nation states also, despite these nationalistic tendencies of particularly the great powers, we do see efforts by many other countries to cooperate uh, not only to fight the pandemic, uh, but in other ways as well. Uh, we've seen, for example, a number of warring parties uh, have acceded to the U United Nations Secretary General's call for a global ceasefire, which is very encouraging. So um, it's really important to seize this moment, to convert this awareness of injustice, uh, this visceral feeling of solidarity and connection with the rest of humanity, uh, into something more solid than just feeling, because feelings are fickle, uh, to convert them into political and policy decisions based on that recognition of universal and equal rights, um, and the recognition that the fundamental duty of governments is to guarantee those rights for all people, and especially for the most vulnerable. And it's interesting, I, I've seen surveys uh, recently that have found that trust in government and recognition of the centrality of its role has been increasing since the onset of the pandemic in, in, you know, in part because really we have no choice but to, to depend on government to, to protect us, but that's an opportunity as well. Uh, and so I think the petition is a positive and constructive step toward helping the world move in that direction. Uh, it does put forth some concrete goals to be sought in all spheres of life. For example, universal access to quality health care, economies aimed not at growth as a primary objective, but the well-being of people, more and stronger democracy, and robust international cooperation. So I think it would be good to discuss in this webinar how to make the most of this petition toward achieving real change beyond collecting more signatures, which we would of course like to do, but how to mobilize real political action around it to convert these goals into concrete policies and programs and legislation. So I would really be interested in getting feedback and suggestions from the participants on the content itself and how to make the best use of it and what we can all do to make that happen. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Eureko, uh, for those reflections, which I think were extremely helpful for beginning the conversation. Um, I would look to the other panelists and then to our viewers as well to reflect on the challenge you've put out of how to, how to uh, move from lines in a petition to actual political action, uh, because that's why we're in the game. Uh, with that, I would... Uh, remind all of our webinar participants that you can submit questions or comments, please do, via the Q&A button uh, in Zoom, or uh, if you're watching on another platform by whatever uh, 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 works in that uh, system. Um, so now I, I'm going to turn to Dominikos Krisidis, who is the managing editor of Katoikos, the online magazine of Fox. Dominikos, could you uh, walk us through some of the main points from the petition. Thank you, Richard, and thank you also, Eureka, for the great introduction. I think that Katoikos actually builds on these elements, and this is what we are also trying to do. Um, apart from Katoikos, apart from being the, is, let's say, the communication arm of of the Foundation for Global Governance and Sustainability, it is also about building a community of people that they are young but also young at heart that they want to change things they want to reform the way we do stuff uh, especially in the way we do economy um, that so that it responds to people who actually need and uh, translate this global love into into action so based on um, 
based on what you said, I think that we can also share it with the participants the fact that we are going to share a link with them to actually say how they liked this uh, webinar and whether they would have any advice or even how we could cooperate together in order to put this petition into more action. So uh, staying a little bit on the petition, well, you have probably seen that we have around 1,000 signatures. We want, of course, this number to, to let it grow. So please do not hesitate to share and comment on the, on the petition. Um, it is weird um, to say that a crisis offers an opening, but it is also true that, we, that there have been lots of things that we used to have in the debate that, um, that the momentum we thought that it was lost. Things but in COVID-19, the COVID-19 crisis offers this opportunity to discuss to discuss about and um, I'm sorry, I think that I have a connection problem, but I guess that now it is okay. Yes. Sorry for this. Um, Brussels has been uh, as I'm saying. <laughs> Perhaps we could take a short break here uh, and uh, give Dominicos a minute to reestablish his uh, contact. Um, maybe I could uh, take advantage then of the break to put a question to uh, Eureka. One of the viewers has uh, just asked uh, if uh, we think that the coronavirus is going to drive the world in the direction of chaos before it's possible to mobilize political action. Do you feel optimistic or, uh, uh, and what, what can we do to ensure that we do uh, achieve the direction of moving towards uh, political action rather than uh, chaos, authoritarianism, and deterioration. I honestly think it can go either way, but uh, I think, you know, precisely uh, we're engaged in this activity so that we can uh, take this momentum in a positive direction. And, and I think it depends on, on the one hand, on political leadership, which, you know, I, I think we're seeing really good and positive leadership and really worrying, uh, self-serving, uh, destructive leadership. Uh, and I think there it depends a lot on what you were saying, Richard, about uh, citizen engagement mm -hmm. to demand that there is inclusive and constructive leadership. And an initiative like this to, to, to put forward a proposal around which people can uh, come together and, and have a constructive discussion on, on what to do is, is one way to take things in a, in a positive direction. Uh, I think that's a very good point. I was struck in your, in your intervention uh, when you spoke about the all or nothing battle. It does seem that things are quite polarized um, and everything that all of us can do as citizens to promote rational debate as opposed to um, conspiracy theories and histrionics is, is helpful. Uh, just keeping our friends and family and networks calm for a, a, re a, a discussion about important issues and the kind of changes that we want to make. Well, it looks like uh, Dominikos has reestablished contact. Uh, maybe not. Nope. So, Yorgos, how be I turn the floor over to you to pick up the baton and say uh, a bit more about some of the elements of the uh, of the petition and uh, following up on what Eureka was saying, how we might take these issues forward. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Richard. I'm sorry about the technical problems, but I hope um, our participants can, uh, can still follow us. And we're improvising a bit, but we are getting there. Um, of course, we want uh, this petition um, as an excuse, in a way, to start a broader discussion. And of course, uh, all support is very welcome. If you can uh, promote it, as Dominikos also said earlier, I, we had uh, divided up the elements so I can discuss about some of the elements of the petition in more detail, what we want to achieve with some of them, and then Dominikos hopefully can come back and complete the picture. Um, starting from uh, element two that I was supposed to talk about is the disaster preparedness, because we saw once again that uh, although it was expected that we, there would be another pandemic like this, there have been several pandemics which did not reach the core of the developed world, but this one hit straight to the core, Europe and North America. And now uh, we seem to be unprepared, or at least at the beginning, very unprepared, individually as countries, as uh, regions, but also as the world, uh, to, uh, to uh, address this quickly and uh, efficiently and effectively. So we should expect more of this because of climate change, also because of other challenges that are out there for the whole planet. So we should be ready. We need this, what we used to call civil defense. We need um, people to be ready to uh, operate in different ways when a disaster strikes. We need to have different uh, supply routes and also accessible basic necessities so that we don't rely on far away channels to get our basic provisions. For example, you saw what happened with masks or ventilators or other material that was not readily available where it was needed. And it took a long time to, to get it together. So we see that the, the meaning of resilience is very important in the practice of resilience. It's not only growth, 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 and we become very efficient as well, but if something goes wrong, then the system collapses. We need to have also local um, resilience, meaning we can rely on locally produced food, on a locally held um, um, basic material to withstand a shock like this one. We need to, from an early age, to educate um, the kids and all of us how to deal with an emergency like this or with the forest fire or with an earthquake or all this stuff. It used to be common when I was growing up and I was in school, but it seems that we have forgotten. We have relied too much on the perfection of our civilization. And then we cannot um, uh, make it work when something uh, goes wrong. Very central to all this is the need for a new economy because the economy is the one that distributes the resources, right? And organizes um, the activities, gives the incentives to people and gives them also the means to, to, to survive. And what we saw in this case is how fragile the economy of the world is and how uh, dependent again on a continuous growth pattern, which is not always possible. Now we're going to face a recession, could be a depression, and all that because of a virus that attacked us, right? So something has to change. And what we propose also in another output of FOGS, an action plan for the UN, the world, uh, and the world after COVID-19, is that we need a new economy and we should be looking at the economy as a common good as a global public good, an economy that's resilient and equitable, an economy that works for all. And it is possible to have it, but we need to change the basic paradigm or the way we think and the way the, the economy works as a result. So we need to start, for example, thinking what is important in terms of value. And when it comes to difficult circumstances of survival, and um, an emergency like this, what is of value is really survival, med medicine, other things which may not be expensive but have to be available locally. So we need what we said before, the supply chains that are also local. 
At the same time, that helps with the environment because if you don't need to transport all these goods from the other end of the earth, you have a smaller um, a footprint, carbon footprint, right? So it can be made, the economy can be made to work for people and the planet much more. It has to recognize the essential workers that the Yuriko talked about. We see these big differentials in salaries, in payments, big CEOs making huge amounts of money and people who are really keeping us alive now from nurses and doctors to supermarket the workers being undervalued in this economy that um, tries to squeeze a lot of work and, less, and give them less pay. That also has to be taken into account. We need a more equitable system. And we also need uh, guarantees for basic income. Like all governments now in practice are doing that. Um, they are providing people with a basic um, income to keep them going during this period, even if they lose their jobs. There is a lot of work being done by many think tanks and experts on how this could be generalized, a basic um, income for everybody all the time to take away also the precariousness at, of uh, the, the worries of people for basic necessities and to, um, and to make the system more equitable. So, um, Another, of course, thing that we need is, as we see now, the advanced technologies and innovation, social and technological innovation. Uh, we uh, see that we can use um, um, the ICT, the information communications technologies, a lot, but we don't know how they are governed. We are not fully sure that our rights are respected. Um, that our privacy is respected, that we're not being followed, uh, let's say, and um, our actions registered. That is also a very basic thing, how democracy and human rights can work in this context of um, an emergency where an authoritarian government can uh, take over, govern by decree, and use it to expand its powers beyond what is needed to address the emergency. So we do need to, to think of innovation in protest, because if you cannot uh, come together because of social distances, how do you protest? Our petition, and any petition is one way of doing that, but also we have to see different ways of people uh, keeping control uh, of um, the executive branch and of maintaining checks and balances under conditions that are not the regular ones. Even elections had to be postponed during this period. Uh, the whole democratic edifice may be challenged in practice, and so we have to be prepared for that. So innovation, not only technological, but social is very important. We see also that we need a lot of logistics, immediate deployment um, uh, of, um, the equipment that is needed, et cetera, and we see a new role for the army. Instead of killing people, the military could finally find a more useful role in saving lives. And again, they are called to do that. But let's make this de facto innovation now in terms of logistics, medical expertise that they can deploy easily. In terms of also, um, let's say the use of the military in other situations like forest fires, etc. let's institutionalize it and let's have it part of their role and making it more and more central part of the military's role. Um, and I'll be finishing by saying, talking about strong international cooperation that um, we see in the middle of this crisis, unfortunately the US, uh, stopped funding the WHO, the organization that brings together the medical expertise of the world and brings together also the ministries of health. It's a mechanism that is there to help deal exactly with situations like this. And not only in crisis, but follows medical developments all the time. So we have to acknowledge that value and we have to invest more, not less, in um, the global governance and cooperation system. We need to, of course, improve it. 
the United Nations is the central body for global um, governance and cooperation. It has a lot of weaknesses, but it also uh, has some unique characteristics that it covers the whole world and has the common interest in mind. So instead of withdrawing, let's get together to improve it and to make it really what it's supposed to be. Um, and, um, a network of uh, freely cooperating uh, peoples and, and governments and other institutions. And we can see more when we ask questions. Thank you. Thanks, Yorgos. You've raised a number of things that perhaps we could come back to in the second round when we get into the questions. Um, for now, I would uh, come back to Dominikos just to make sure that uh, you've managed to reestablish communication in the disaster preparedness mode um, and uh, that you could then wrap up uh, with the elements you wanted to highlight from the petition. So, Dominikos, do we have communication? Thank you, Richard. And I'm not, I, I won't turn on my camera so that I ensure that, so I don't take the risk to, <laughs> to disconnect again because of the unstable connection. Um, so building on the things that Georgios actually said, um, I think that we can stay a little bit on the, cope, uh, cope on the need to cooperate internationally and link this with, um, with what, I, what I was trying to say before about the public health systems is that we, of course, um, health is, uh, is, on, is on the governments, is on the national governments, but, and these are who are responsible for their own citizens, but major cross-border threats to public health, such as COVID-19 and other crises that may come in the future, it shows clearly the need that we need to cooperate and we don't need to close border. This can be seen as an example for uh, regional institutions like the European Union, or international institutions like the UN. So it is becoming increasingly clear that uh, health, social, but also climate cha challenges, that these are all very interconnected, uh, that we have show challenges that we are facing now can be only be tackled through closer co collaboration at all levels of uh, governance. And I would particularly like to say that it's also the moment because I'll talk about public, I'm talking about public health now. It's also the moment to, let's say, recognize the great work of all these underpaid people, especially women in the health sector in many countries in Europe and the world. Um, um, so, and, and, and there is also this public gratitude towards the hero of the coronavirus, something that we have seen a lot on social media. Now we have the chance to collectively actually stand up for those protecting and they took care of us during these hard times. And it's also time our societies to tackle uh, concrete steps so, so that we show value for actually the, the people that they, as Georgia said, people that actually do the real work. So if we want a truly healthy society, we need to invest in caring for those uh, who need it. And well-funded public health systems, uh, especially after the austerity, uh, period that many countries have been through, um, it's, it's very important to, um, to, to build on. And um, we've also included the element of telehealth. And I would like to, to say that technology is a very important aspect to this, let's say, transition um, for better public health systems. But it's also a great risk because it may, it may mean that um, that people that have no access to internet or they have no phone, then they cannot um, be examined online. So telehealth is a good idea, but it's also, but if it's um, if it's everywhere, then we need to see who actually has the the, the means to do telehealthing. Um, so a, an important element that we also have put in the petition is a guaranteed income for all. Uh, it is clear that the pandemic um, has revealed an economic depression. That there will be an economic depression coming. Um, um, as I said before, the, uh, the guaranteed income is is one of these terms that used to be long time ago in the in the debate, but it somehow lost its momentum. But now we've seen in the in the media that this has played a lot, um, even even. Uh, 
governments have published reports like uh, Finland because they have been implementing a basic income the last uh, the last years. Uh, we've also seen uh, Canada that uh, has pledged to around two thousand uh, Canadian dollars a month for some citizens, and they want to expand this. Uh, but we also we've also seen some other statements like uh, Pope Francis, for example, oh, that he in his Easter letter he says that it's might it may be time to consider a universal basic income. So it is the time to talk about big ideas, and because the crisis is very big, I think that we also need to be ambitious, and I think we don't need to um, we don't need to stay anymore to the to the um, doctrine that not everything is possible. Everything is possible exactly because uh, exactly because we need to we need to work hard to to bring big solutions. Um, another point I would like to raise is the increased work uh, teleworking and teleconferencing. Um, we've suggested this because we think that there is lots of money to be saved actually from taxpayers because the, especially in the public uh, in the international institutions people they travel a lot. It's good because people are connected. This is what we want to do, definitely. But by um, turning these meetings into virtual, there is a double gain. One is that we don't spend public resources, taxpayers' money, um, on flights and big conferences. On the other hand, it's also good for the climate. And all these distance learning tools, they can be also, they, they, they have to be connected to social justice issues. Uh, because the more um, um, distance um, uh, tools we use, uh, the better access we can ensure for people. And I would say that the last and a very important point that I would like to talk, and with this um, I'll end my, uh, my, the points I wanted to raise, is point six uh, of the petition, reliable, safe and privacy respecting access to the internet and social media which should be treated as global cyber commons, we say at Fox and Katoikos. So that's a very big debate. Um, there is a clear push, um, and that's not only my point of view, but we read lately lots of articles um, to permanently in integrate technology into every aspect of civic life, which includes things like as telehealth, remote learning, uh, and broadband, things that we have already discussed, um, some of them George has also presented. This, of course, is a big question on equality, because this is a future uh, in which the privileged, the ones that they have resources, um, they can have delivered everything home, either virtually or via streaming and cloud uh, technology. Um, Whereas all the other ones that they have no access to drones or media platform or digital platforms, etc., they will be probably excluded. Um, so, but but that's also, that's also a great danger because um, our every there is a risk that our every relationship is trackable, traceable, and and with all these data exchange that the economy e economy may bring, it's. Uh, it will probably bring lots of gains for the big tech giants, but not for real people. And the biggest question around this is the is artificial the debate on artificial intelligence, of course, and public life. We see that in China, facial recognition is almost a reality uh, for them, and I would say for many other um, many others in Silicon Valley, the pandemic is a is a golden opportunity, is an opportunity to make money. Uh, uh, and to take, uh, and let's say, by taking advantage of the common enemy, which is of course the the coronavirus, to actually apply um, a bigger uh, a bigger uh, thing that they want to do, so that they can make money, but also control the populations. But I'm not saying that technology is bad. But what I'm saying is that it may be, it may uh, include lots of risks and dangers that we. Or as people, we have to try to fix it as much as possible, and we also need to demand this from governments and international institutions, so that human rights are in place, and um, and we integrate an approach that is social, just, and fair for all.
Thank, Thank you, Richard. You, uh, Dominikos. Um, we're starting to get some, some questions. Thank you. Uh, please send more uh, of these. I'd like to perhaps throw one out generally to the members of the panel. We have had a couple of questions from uh, viewers who are asking, how can we take forward this initiative? Uh, how do we get results from this type of action? Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on things like how we can team, how, how people of like mind can team up. There are other forces seeking the kind of changes we're advocating for in this pe petition. How can we partner with them? Um, how, what role is there for uh, advocacy groups like ourselves versus more mainstream, large political act actors like political parties, uh, labor movement, uh, uh, environment, and social social uh, awareness organizations. Um, let's exchange a few views on how we can take these initiatives forward so that we actually begin to see them reflected in laws, regulations, and, and public policy. Who would like to uh, uh, take a stab at that? Yorgos, maybe, first? Yes, I can do it. Thank you. And then Yuriko. Um, as you may have seen, the petition. Great. Uh, as you may have seen, the petition is addressed to the Secretary General of the United Nations and the leaders of all countries of the world. So at least um, symbolically, that is the target of the petition. If we get a big enough number, we could actually present it to them, and I think we should, uh, through their representations or representatives, uh, we'll find a way to make them aware of it. And we have already sent it to people in the UN, in some governments. So the more uh, signatures we have, the better it is for the petition to be noticed. The second is we, um, of course, as a think, uh, think tank, we have the capacity to be a bit more creative or a bit more, more forward looking and freer than a government ministry or somebody else who would be obliged to stick more to the rules of the game today. So thinking out of the box, I think we also pull others out. So by just generating these discussions, and we also have other brainstorming sessions with officials, etc., that FOGS organizes, we uh, have this opportunity to, um, let's say, sow the seeds of, of these changes. And of course, civil society, there are many petitions and many initiatives that cover parts of this usually, but not the whole picture. One thing about FOGS is that we want to have a new narrative for globalization. So we want to create this new paradigm that will enable thinking in a different way and will make all these things natural. Because let me tell you, I'm sorry if I, I hope I'm not abusing my privilege now, but I got a, a joke from a friend and he said, why is the bicycle a horrible thing? It's a criminal thing to uh, cycle and to have a bicycle and uh, it is against capitalism and globalization because a bike means that you probably won't buy or use a car. If you don't buy or use a car, then you don't, uh, you don't uh, let the economy work and the industry produce uh, from the mines to whatever, the automobile industry and all that. And if you don't let that operate as it is up to now, then you don't create the pollution and the health issues you don't give then work to hospitals and doctors. And, and then having a bike is criminal for the economy and you're destroying it. So you can see how perverse the current way of thinking is. And what we are doing through this, by these 10 elements, is to get people started thinking in a different way. And as you can see on the roll-up behind me, we're trying to talk in FOGS, as you know very well, Richard, and all the others, and Yuriko and Dominikos, about a new narrative and new way of thinking for globalization which is more equitable people-centered not profit-centered and more also um, ethical and planet respecting so i think this is one way of doing it to to have a petition to talk about it and the more 
it's not about the better it is. Thanks. Thanks, Yorgos. Eureka, could you share your reflections on that point, please? Yes. Um, I think one thing that's important uh, when you're trying to achieve concrete change is to think about what are those key moments where change can happen in meaningful ways. And, and I think one of them uh, is budgetary decisions, when, when budgets are formulated and then they're approved by the, the legislative body. Uh, so you, I think one thing you would want to do is to have an influence in that uh, process. For example, uh, if we're talking about well-funded health systems, well, uh, I think it is important for people in all countries to see how health budgets have been evolving. Have they been going down? Have they been coming up? Uh, and um, I, I had some interesting experiences while working in the UN system of helping uh, civic groups to, to, to have an influence on budgets and particularly to, to increase social spending. Uh, and one of them was in, uh, 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 within the context of a very uh, severe economic crisis. Uh, this was in Ecuador. And what we were able to see is that even in the worst possible circumstances, there are things that you can do to protect uh, um, budgets for health, for education. There are other things that you can shave off to put into priority activities. So, so uh, one thing to think about is to how to is how to influence budgets, uh, whether through your local uh, uh, um, parliamentarian or. Uh, um, by talking to, to the bureaucrats who, who formulate the budget, uh, but to, to show that uh, you, you do care what happens and to form alliances and coalitions with people so that you are a political force. Uh, and I think another opportunity is elections, and there are elections coming up in many countries in the world, one of them is in the US, uh, and um, it's important for these issues to become uh, uh, priorities in public debate. And, and in these, I think, uh, opportunities, it is, of course, important to, to appeal to the candidates, but it's also equally or maybe even more so to, uh, important to appeal to the voters uh, so that they demand that these issues be addressed and all politicians respond to opportunities to gain votes and if they see that this is of importance to the voters well you know they'll they'll talk about it they'll think about it so thanks Eureka. i really underline that point about the importance of uh people who want change to convey this desire to their elected or to be elected representatives so that this can be factored into the political processes uh, we have a, a comment, really, from uh, one of our viewers who points out that there's a, uh, I'm not sure if tension is the right word, but certainly a competition between the concept of uh, let's recover better and, oh, please, let's go back to business as usual, uh, to the way it was. Uh, I wonder how you would reflect on how one can uh, bring to the fore the idea that we're not really just speaking about th th that in fact going back to business as usual is not enough that we can do better that the world we're speaking about is uh, is uh, an improvement for uh, uh, average people over what we, we currently have how can we bring that message more into the fore and into the, into the public debate would be one question. Um, and I'd like to, because, so that because we're coming close to the end uh, of our webinar, flag another question, which is about means that could be used to improve multilateral institutions. Um, the, uh, uh, Fogs has been active in this area uh, in recent weeks, and maybe Yorgos could give a few insights into what we think would be important means to strengthen 
multilateral uh, responses and the UN system response to COVID and actually maybe even more importantly to the post COVID situation. How do we ensure that the recovery uh, funds are spent wisely and that uh, it isn't uh, uh, another bailout of fossil fuel companies, for example. Um, those types of questions come increasingly to the fore as we, as we move more into the post-lockdown situation. Uh, so uh, that's two questions. Uh, one about uh, uh, making sure we are clear that, we're, that better is better than business as usual for regular people and uh, how to improve international organizations in the short term. Um, maybe I would see if Dominikos would like to comment on, on one of those and then go to Eureka and uh, Yorgos for final comments before we conclude. Thank you, Richard. So going back to business, I understand because I've seen also the comments and I understand why people, they want to go back to business because some of them, they, they've lost their jobs. Uh, some of them, they, they, they have no revenue because they, they are independent. And that's a very clear message it, that exactly because it proved the system itself that um, there is something wrong when a crisis appears. It is exactly the reason that we need to change the way we do things. And I would mention here that the SDGs is the way to go. So when we do policy planning, um, when we do business investments, everything has to be in accordance with international declarations, in accordance with human rights uh, and the SDGs, not just in mind, because this is what I've read usually in reports. I don't want uh, international organizations and governments to report just on the SDGs, but their planning has to be 100% compatible with the SDGs. So in, an integrated approach into the planning, into planning in social policy, in the way we do economy, I would, that's the way I would, I would answer that we need to go forward. Thanks, uh, Dominikos. Eureka. Yes, on the issue of business as usual versus doing things differently, um, I think there may be two aspects to that. One is, um, well, precisely what, you know, Foggs proposes to do, which is to build a new narrative. And um, I think we're already seeing some of that in good ways and bad ways. I mean, um, for example, uh, um, New Zealand has often been touted as a big success. Uh, and um, the Prime Minister's leadership as, as a positive example. And, and it, it struck me how often she refers to the importance of being kind. Uh, you know, be safe, be careful, be kind. And, and that's something very new, you know, in the political lexicon of leaders. Uh, but it's, I, I think it's been very much embraced uh, in New Zealand and, and those of us who've been watching uh, that country. And, and, you know, it's resonated. Uh, whereas, you know, you also have negative examples of, of uh, using sort of weaponizing the situation to go after political enemies. Um, so I think it can go both ways, but I think that the, the building a new narrative towards uh, a better and more care, caring and more inclusive future is important. Um, and then I think uh, it, the other thing is, is to get away from this, you know, what we were saying about the, the all or, or nothing uh, approach and to really get down to specifics. You know, what do we mean when we talk about getting back to normal and doing things better? Uh, it's not one or the other, you know. Uh, so, okay, you want to open up businesses, but do you agree that we need to keep uh, our workers safe? Well, of course I do, you know. Uh, so what can we do uh, to, to help keep people safe and at the same time keep the business going? Um, can we do this? Can we do what? I mean, to go into specifics uh, so that you're getting away from arguments of principle and values, which, you know, you can't negotiate on, but, you know, on, on, on details, on concrete 
things on specific things you can uh, uh, negotiate and, and discuss without, you know, uh, getting into a screaming match. So um, those are two things. Uh, and on the multilateral institutions, I think what, well, one thing that's always frustrated me working within the UN system is uh, on the side of the leadership uh, uh, and the staff, uh, this fear of, of uh, getting involved in so-called sensitive issues and, and not offending the government because otherwise, you know, we can't maintain a relationship of cooperation. Um, I think we can be a little bit bolder uh, um, in, uh, not necessarily in criticizing governments, but in pointing out things that are not okay and, and things that need to be improved. Uh, again, based on evidence, on specifics, uh, but based on those things to, to build policies that are, are, that point toward better and more, more fairer and just uh, values for a country. Uh, and I think that will help strengthen the system as well. Excellent. Thanks, Eureka. Um, Yorgos, uh, last reflections uh, from your side, please. Thank you, Richard. I think what, uh, and, um, a result of what Yuriko also said, like a um, conclusion is that we need, we need leadership and courage at all levels. Uh, from leaders who have the name, but sometimes they're too cautious to uh, really point to the problems and uh, invite, if they don't have the solution, they should invite an honest debate about them, debate about them. Uh, to the average person, it's our responsibility also of each one of us, and we should not abdicate our rights as citizens and as uh, human beings who want to live in a better world. So recover better, or recover worse, the, the only sure thing, certain thing is that we are not going to recover the same. Even if we want to go back to business as usual, we cannot. Things have changed. Uh, a lot of money has been spent. A lot of people have died, and we shouldn't forget that also. And more may die because there can be a second wave, all these things. We're not out of it yet. So the world will be different whether we like it or not. The problem or the issue here and what is at stake is that we want it to be better and not worse for the majority of people. And that's what this petition is trying to do. And that's our work even before the emergency, because we had seen other emergencies with seen climate, right? Food insecurity, other things. There is always an emergency around ready to blow out of proportion as happened with this one. The Secretary General of the United Nations, he talks about recovering better. The European Union, and its president, the president of the European Commission, have been talking about a European Green Deal for some time now. And that has acquired a new meaning uh, with COVID-19. We, we should not, let's say, abandon the, the previous plans for the other emergency, which is climate, to now just do medical things. We have to combine them, and there are things that can be done for all of them. So recover better beyond the slogan is really a reminder that we have to make sure that this change that's happening goes in a positive direction. And there are some blueprints like the European Green Deal, the Recover Better um, a notion of the Secretary General. And folks, you please uh, follow us on www.fox.org. We have uh, two papers for the UN. They are encouraging specific action uh, from, uh, for a symbolic new beginning and a new economy, a new narrative, and bringing the world together to, to get out of this um, in a good way for all. Companies also, because there was a question, everybody can do their part. We see now companies like huge airlines asking to be bailed out. This is not the way it should be done. If they are bailed out, they have to uh, be, uh, to, to promise and actually do for sure, um, green themselves, uh, change the way they operate, ensure that their people have uh, secure employment and other conditions. You cannot use taxpayers' money when you need it and when during the good days you don't save and you give more dividends and higher salaries. This is not fair. 
And of course, the SMEs, the smaller, medium, uh, the, uh, small and medium-sized companies, those are really the backbone of the economy, and we should think of them because they are much more reliable in periods of crisis. They are locally connected with people, and they help us all survive. So we should give more, pay more attention to them. And about uh, FOGS, what we do um, is we try to be both a think tank and a high level in a way um, provider of advice if we can. And also we try to build the community, as Dominico said, with the Katoikos. Uh, please join whichever branch or both you, you feel like. We don't have a huge capacity in terms of people. We rely only on our own contributions. We don't get big money from any public or private source. Uh, we will do crowdfunding, etc. But we want to be a catalyst. We cannot do all these things ourselves. Do get in touch with us, info at fogs.org. If you have any idea how you can organize better in your area, any idea how we can maximize our impact and uh, make our message more widely heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yorgos. Um, that uh, brings us to the end of today's webinar. I would like to thank uh, the panelists, particularly for their interesting, provocative, and active uh, engagement. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, all of you who've signed the Engage for Better petition uh, and for uh, your active participation in this discussion today. Uh, as Jurgos just said, please do follow up by checking our websites and social media, uh, which will be shown on the screen. Um, and follow some of FOG's other initiatives. For example, this is the year of the 75th anniversary of the, of the founding of the United Nations, and we're trying to promote a discussion about how, what kind of UN do we want going forward to the year 100, uh, to, the, uh, for the, to the 100th birthday of the UN. Uh, so please also register for FOG's or Kotiko's updates. And if you, uh, feel so inclined, we'd really encourage you to promote this petition to your friends and uh, in your networks. Please do raise some of these issues in your political conversations with your elected representatives, whether at city level or in parliaments. Jorgos mentioned the European Parliament. One of our uh, review, uh, viewers also mentioned the importance of what's happening in the European Parliament right now. And I think if we want to see political change, there has to be pressure from the grassroots for these kind of changes to be implemented against the forces uh, who would not like to see uh, these changes. So the petition is one way, but it's only a indicator of how we can drive change. We thank you for your interest in it. We thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll stay with us and help to achieve the kind of better world that we are striving to find. Thanks very much. And until the next uh, webcast, uh, webinar, bye-bye.